transcript for May 27th. Um, Sorry for the slight delay in starting. You know, we just don't seem to have 100% luck, and every now and again we um, have a hiccup, and the hiccup was everybody could be heard except for me. <laughs> but now I'm online. I'm Tracy Morong, and I'm one of the co-chairs, uh, along with uh, Darlene Bolivar of the IWK Health Centre in Halifax of the uh, CAPSI Patient Safety Collaborative. We have a great um, collaborative confer conference call set up today. Um, including Greg Kennedy from Accreditation Canada and Margaret Colhoun from um, ISMP. And we also have Elaine Orbein online and Lisa Stromquist from the CAFC office, as, as well as many of you also. Um, I just wanted to point out as we start to remind you that the lines are actually all muted from the CAFC powerful end. Um, but people can ask questions by typing them into the control panel uh, on their computer. Uh, participants can also use the VoIP or Voice over IP or telephone as their audio option. If they don't have a mic on their computer, um, they will not have the option of being unmuted to ask questions, but um, they can choose a telephone option and dial the toll-free number. Um, uh, basically, that's it on the technical side. The, this, uh, the April presentation is posted on the CAFC website, just for those of you that attended last month and would be interested to look at it. And uh, today's presentation will also be available on the CAFC website. Um, okay, so today, what's today's call all about? Well, um, of course, it's a really important patient safety one, and it's all about pediatric opi opioid safety and uh, moving us towards a change in practice because it's a very complicated topic and an important thing to um, be working collaborati collaboratively with, um, with our pediatric health center peers across the country. Um, I think with no further ado, what I will do then is move directly to um, uh, introducing Greg Kennedy and Mark Colhoun, but I'll introduce Greg first and allow him to do his presentation. So Greg is a, um, a health services research specialist in program development at Accreditation Canada. And in this role, Greg oversees the ongoing development and maintenance of the accreditation program particularly in terms of required organizational practices, those ROPs that we all know and love, performance measures, patient safety, and client experience. Previous to joining Accreditation Canada, Greg worked as a research associate in the Division of Preventive Oncology at Cancer Care Ontario. He holds a Master's of Science in, in Epidemiology and Population Health from Queen's and a Bachelor of Science in Cell Biology from McGill University. So I'll turn the, uh, the speaker over to Greg, and he'll be presenting on clarifying the medication use ROPs, narcotic safety, and drug concentration. The ROPs that we all know and love. Thank you. I like that line. In the uh, forefront of my mind as we're preparing for our survey in September. <laughs> Feel biased there. And good morning to everyone else on the line, and thank you, Tracy. And also thank you to the CAFC team for having me back again today. The last few sessions I presented here with the collaborative focused on Accreditation Canada's ROPs that pertain to safety, culture, and communication. And today I'm going to shift gears a bit and hopefully provide you with some clarification on the medication use ROPs. So for any of you new to Accreditation Canada, an ROP, or Required Organizational Practice, is defined as an essential practice that organizations must have in place to enhance patient safety and to minimize risk. So in the 15 minutes I have with you today, we're going to focus on the two ROPs highlighted in blue, uh, both found under the patient safety goal area of medication use. And again, those are the drug concentrations ROP and the narcotic safety ROP. The drug concentrations ROP has been in place since we launched Qmentum in 2008 and the narcotic safety ROP was added uh, a little bit later in 2009. Both of those ROPs are found in Accreditation Canada's Managing Medication Standards, and that's the core set of standards that is applied across an entire organization, across all service areas. And both of the ROPs, I should acknowledge, were developed in close consultation with the team at ISMP Canada. As always, I just want to take a quick second to point you uh, to any of those who may have missed our previous sessions on the collaborative to my favorite book, and that's the ROP Handbook. 
So the handbook is available for free download on Accreditation Canada's website. It was last updated April 1st, and it contains uh, all 36 versions of the ROP with some helpful reference sections to assist you with implementation. So the first ROP that we'll be covering today is the Drug Concentrations ROP. Taking a brief look at some statistics from Accreditation Canada's 2010 National Report on ROPs, across 236 on-site surveys of Canadian healthcare organizations that happened in 2009, the drug concentrations ROP had the very highest compliance rate across all the ROPs, coming in at 97%, and that was up uh, from 92% in 2008. Compliance with this ROP was consistently high across all organizations, across the continuum of care, and there, we just saw a slight dip in major health systems where rates were between 82 and 89%. So in looking at the rationale behind the drug concentrations ROP, it's quite straightforward. And the idea is that having multiple concentrations of the same medication available increases the risk that a healthcare provider will select, dispense, or administer a wrong concentration. And therefore, by reducing the number of concentrations available, we hopefully decrease the risk of medication errors. Thank you. Uh, and not only is standardizing drug concentrations important within a facility or an organization, but where possible, it's also very important within health reasons or systems. And this is particularly necessary in instances where healthcare providers may move between sites with a lot of frequency and standardization across sites also enhances safety when critically ill patients are transferred between facilities. Uh, and of course, as the physiological systems of pediatric patients are really sensitive to drug concentration, uh, standardization to the best extent possible is really of paramount importance for patient safety in these settings. So here we see the ROP statement that the organization standardizes and limits the number of medication concentrations available. And the loan test of compliance, echoing that, medication concentrations are standardized and limited across the organization. In terms of expectations uh, during the on-site survey for this ROP, Accreditation Canada surveyors will be moving through their tracers and they'll be looking for evidence that, uh, exactly as we said in the test for compliance, the organizations have standardized and limited the drug concentrations available. And there is a, a realization that the types of medications and the standard concentrations may differ based on an organization's patient population. So, for example, some hospitals, special concentrations may need to be available for uh, premature babies. And the decisions around these specific concentrations should be made by the hospital staff, pharmacy staff, based on safe medication use guidelines and the work of organizations like IFMP Canada. In terms of the supporting evidence for surveyors, suggestions for what organizations may provide can be lists of standardized drug concentrations available, uh, possibly minutes from pharmacy committee meetings, uh, where you've hashed out the standardized concentrations that are established and available. And those are just a few suggestions. Um, lastly, for the drug concentrations RLP, I wanted to draw your attention quickly to an interesting paper I came across in my research. This paper combined uh, standardization of drug concentrations in a pediatric setting with infusion pump technology and they were successful in demonstrating a, a drastic reduction in medication infusion errors. And the table that's on the screen here includes a list of standardized concentrations that were established for 32 common drugs in the pediatric setting that were thought uh, based on the organizations they looked at to represent about 95% of infused medications in the pediatric setting. So I thought this might be a good reference for any organizations looking to compare the standard concentrations available in their hospital with, with something, uh, this case being from the US. The next 
next ROP we're going to look at is the narcotic safety ROP. And again, looking at the national compliance rates across all Canadian healthcare organizations, we see that the narcotic safety ROP introduced again in 2009 was the ROP with the fourth highest compliance rate of all ROPs in the program, and it came in at 94% compliance in 2009. And normally with uh, an ROP that was introduced in the year that it was introduced, we'd see a lot lower rate as it takes some time for organizations to implement. And I think the 94% the here in its first year of evaluation just really speaks to the widespread realization of how important this is as a patient safety issue. On the screen here is the narcotic safety ROP statement. Uh, there's a great deal of similarity between this ROP and the drug concentrations ROP. Yet this ROP, of course, focuses in greater detail on narcotic products. Uh, certain elements of this ROP have really strong alignment with recommendations coming out of previous work that ISMP Canada did in Ontario on, in the hospital narcotic opioid project and much more relevant to the group on the call today. Uh, some good alignment with the recommendations coming out of the ISMP Canada CAPC pediatric opioid safety project. So looking at the first test for compliance, it's quite straightforward. This is the audit, audit piece. And um, the audit involves, again, just a review of the products and quantities that are stored and subsequently removing any of those products which are identified as unnecessary. The second test for compliance gets into more detail around specific concentrations that should be removed. So the specific concentrations are hydromorphone ampoules or vials with concentration greater than 2 milligrams per milliliter, and morphine ampoules or vials with concentrations greater than 15 milligrams per milliliter. And my sense in looking at some of the recommendations that came out of ISFP Canada's narcotic opioid project is that we may need to build in another specific concentration around morphine ampoules in the pediatric patient care areas, so that's something that uh, I will follow up on with ISMP Canada in the next iteration of the ROP. An exception that's identified here is that of palliative care. Uh, again, this exception may be more focused on adult acute care settings, but the underlying principle around this exception is that the storage uh, of highly concentrated opioids in patient care areas should be avoided whenever possible. And in any patient care area, when an individual requires a specific opioid that's not routinely stocked in that area, it should be provided only for the duration of that patient's stay and then return to pharmacy. Uh, and throughout the duration, all possible safeguards put in place to mitigate risk. So some examples of those safeguards could include automated dispensing cabinets and patient-specific labeling, just to name a couple. The third and final test for compliance specifies that the organization standardize and limits the number of parenteral narcotic concentrations available. And from the reading I did, it sounds like this can be especially challenging in pediatric settings as infants and young children require relatively low doses of intravenous injections. And this is sometimes challenging uh, with equipment limitations. Uh, however, a piece of very great news in meeting this ROP and a good segue into Marg's presentation is that through the ISMP CAPC Pediatric Opioid Safety Project, there's a series of recommendations that have been made around standardized concentrations of opioid infusion. And uh, I think what Marg's going to talk about more is a web-based resource kit on the way uh, to assist organizations with implementing those recommendations. So that is it for me, and with that, I guess I'll hand it back over to you, Tracy. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. Thanks, Greg. I think that that's really uh, great for setting the, the framework for um, Mark's presentation, as you mentioned, nice segue. I think also, though, um, everybody online really appreciates the clarity um, and a bit of context around the ROPs just to sort of um, help us better understand and appreciate where they're coming from. So thanks. You did a great job. 
Bye -bye. The, um, at this point, we'll shift over to Mark Cahoon from uh, ISMP Canada. Mark is a project leader with the Institute of Safe Medication Practices in Canada. Um, in addition to over 20 years' experience in hospitals and several administrative positions, Mark consulted both inside and outside of healthcare, including work at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. She joined ISMP Canada in 2000 to lead the Ontario Medication Safety Support Service and has delivered on multiple Canadian sa patient safety projects. Uh, Marg leads the medication reconciliation intervention on behalf of ISMP Canada for Safer Healthcare Now, supporting Canadian teams in acute care, long-term care, and home care. Marg also leads the uh, World Health Organization's High Fives Medication Reconciliation Intervention at the international level, supporting five teams in five countries. Great, exciting work. We'd we'll love to hear from you, Mark. So welcome to the CAFC Patient Safety Collaborative once again. Thank you, Tracy. I should have actually um, redone my bio and said that I've, been, I've had the delightful privilege of working with CAFC since 2006. And the very first meeting that we had was um, in Vancouver. I met with the CAFC Patient Safety Collaborative. I was absolutely inspired by these people. And one of the things that we talked about uh, which is in this background is standardizing solutions. So it was before the um, accreditation ROP. I think that it's true that the work that CAFC and ISMP Canada did um, led to some of the wording in the, R the ROP. And since then, we've been uh, working behind the scenes busily, getting a lot of um, input from a lot of you across the country, and we're very, very excited about talking to you today about our recommendations and the process for moving forward. So I'm going to give you some background. We're going to go through the recommendations, but not all of the guidelines to the recommendations, and talk about next steps. But first I want to root this in some reality. And instead of picking a Canadian example, in front of you, you have an example from uh, Britain. A colleague of ours, David Cousins, uh, reported on this in a pharmacy, pra pharmacy and practice journal in 1997. This was a tenfold or a hundredfold error that had to do with morphine. And I can assure you that we have documented evidence of many of the same types of errors in Canada. The CAFC institutions or the CAFC member institutions and, and other institutions were very gracious in sharing their incidents with us. And the uh, the way that we got to talking about opioids was because of an incident analysis. So let me walk you through that process and then we'll move into the recommendations. So it began in 2006 and what the Patient Safety Collaborative said is we want some guidance on standard concentrations. Basically, we want some guidance. And we also want you to consult with us and then we will be able to contribute to national standards. So phase one was that incident analysis that I referred to. And we had lots of incidents, thousands of incidents given to us. And we had a very thorough um, analysis of that in a report that was done, and many of you have seen that report. We then did a landscape survey of best practices, and we learned in the best practice landscape survey that we needed to begin to differentiate between community and tertiary institutions. And at the end of that phase one, we decided our national advisory group with us decided that we would create an intervention that would assist in the implementation of safe medication practices for the delivery of opioids. And it was that medication incident analysis that showed us that opioids was where we needed to start. The objective of our second phase was to clarify and consult and come to some decisions about what we would recommend. And so you can see the objectives of phase two, and I think that many of you on the line were aware of these objectives. We wanted to develop a set of comprehensive interventions and recommendations, but more than that, we wanted to create tools to support safe opioid medication practice. And we know that the tools are largely available in tertiary institutions, but we really wanted to bring these tools across the country to community hospitals. And I may have this number wrong, Elaine, and you can correct me, but I believe that about 60% of the service to, the, to pediatric patients is in communities. And so we wanted to bring methods of standardization of prescribing, administration, and calculation tools and storage across Canada. And we wanted to use an innovative approach and apply human factors expertise and also psychological theory and practice. And we did that, and uh, the description of that part of it is found in our report. 
But what I'm going to speak to you today is about the um, launch and implementation phase of the tactics, which are not yet related to the psychological work, but you will hear more about that at a, a later date. So these tactics, these tactics are the kinds of things that make sense to clinicians like I think are on the line today. They're the fundamental safety, system safety elements. They are the prescribing standardization patient safety elements. And then they get at dose administration. And how can we help to ensure that dose administration is safe? And one of the principles of safety, of course, in medication system safety in particular, is standardization. So now we're at phase three. Very, very exciting. And this certainly wasn't just the work of, uh, I, I get to be the speaker, but on the line are all of the participants in this. Uh, it, it's everybody who's worked on this for several years who should be excited today. So in, our, in this phase, we're going to disseminate the recommendations, and then we're going to hear back from you about issues around implementation and whether there's any modifications that are required before they become embedded fully in standards. We're going to create a tool on the Knowledge Exchange Network at CAFC, which is fondly known as KEN. Most of you know about KEN. And uh, KEN is meant to provide a way of getting the information that people across the country need in as easy a fashion as possible. We're going to design implementation workshops and webinars, and there will be an ISMP Canada Bulletin that comes out in order to um, uh, document what we've decided across the country and reach thousands of people. So the recommendations have been divided up into tertiary and community. However, it's only when you get to the standardization that there's really differences. The, many of our recommendations are exactly the same for tertiary and community. So the way I've set up this presentation is to show you the standard concentrations, recommendations for tertiary, and then community, and then I'll show you the things that fall together. There are many guidelines that will go towards supporting these recommendations. We don't have time to go through all of those guidelines today. There are also many supporting calculation tools and uh, documents that will be on the CAN. And those will be launched uh, starting later on this summer, and then you will be walked through them in this series of webinars. But to the concentrations that, uh, that were recommended to us and validated across the country, these, uh, this is the recommendation one for tertiary hospitals. We suggest that they Tertiary hospitals adopt standard concentrations for continuous opioid infusion, preferably combined with the use of, uh, no, absolutely combined with the use of infusion dosing charts and or smart pumps, to morphine 0.2 milligrams per mil and 1 milligram per mil, hydromorphone 40 micrograms per mil and 250 micrograms per mil, and fentanyl 10 micrograms per mil and 50 micrograms per mil. We had a group from Edmonton that represented tertiary hospitals across the country who have a report that, you will, that will be available to all of you that, that walks you through how we came to these particular recommendations. It is recognized that there are additional concentrations of opioid continuous infusions that may be required for hospitals caring for very low birth weight babies and hospitals without two decimal point pumps. But, um, there is complete agreement with the tertiary hospitals on the recommendations you see on the screen before you. These aren't new to you. I know that most of you have already seen them, and many of you have implemented them. It was very interesting for us to find out when we met with community and tertiary hospitals together in the summer of 2009 that the community hospitals, when they were shown those, these three uh, morphine, hydromorphone, and fentanyl on the previous page, they said, oh, no, please, don't give us all of those. No, no, we only want morphine. So the first recommendation for community hospitals across Canada is limit the parental opioid agent used for your pediatric patients to morphine. And then once you've limited it to morphine, limit the concentrations and standardize them. So the injectable standard is really um, a large reason for selecting it is it is the lowest concentration of morphine ampule available in Canada right now, and that's 2 milligrams per mil. For infusions, we suggest two strengths, morphine 0.2 milligrams per mil and 1 milligram per mil. And for oral, we suggest morphine oral liquid, 1 milligram per mil. The community hospitals, uh, we chatted with some as recently as the day before yesterday, and um, this is 
what they would like to do, but there are other times when these other two drugs that are on the tertiary list, hydromorphone and fentanyl, may be needed, and so we want to ensure that we restrict access. Uh, we're very clear that we have um, some of the further recommendations you're going to see have to do with differentiation and segregation and implementing other systems in order to uh, provide safety, and those would apply to if you need these two drugs in community hospitals for peace, hydromorphone and fentanyl. But the bottom line is that it's the clinicians out there that wanted us to be very um, clear that morphine is, is what's to be used for pediatric opioids in community hospitals. There are many uh, guidelines and supporting documents that you're going to have on the CAN. And I just picked four of five of these, the guidelines for the tertiary and community hospitals that will uh, support the standard concentration recommendations. We really believe that you should use commercially prepared premixed IV solutions whenever they're available for the manufacturer. I'm in the room with Christine Cosmera, a nurse at ISMP Canada today, and we went across the country for the, or at least across the province, for the adult uh, opioid project. And we know that there are sometimes issues about purchasing commercially available products, and we know that these products will become available as a result of these standard concentration recommendations. Um, we really strongly believe, for many, many reasons, and the references will be on the CAN, that you should buy commercially prepared. There is good data to show in pediatrics that solutions made on the floor frequently are um, unreliable in terms of concentration. So we will give you all of the evidence to try to make this guideline be supported in your institution. The other thing is that um, if IV solutions can't be purchased commercially, then we suggest that they be made in pharmacy. We know that might raise issues with your 20-bed hospitals, and we, again, will provide all kinds of supporting documentation and, and ideas to help you, but we truly believe that these drugs, if you can, buy them or make them in pharmacy. It is ideal to implement these in conjunction with smart pump technology. We know that many institutions across the country are moving to smart pump technology, and you may need a stepwise plan for that implementation. And the support that we will give you will include dosing charts, um, the CHEO program, um, which is an amazing program, smart pump limits, and calculation tools. And there will be a thread of uh, recommendation and guideline that will be um, provided to you and examples um, included on the CAN that speak to segregating, separating, and differentiating admixed opioids from all other IV infusions it's really important to us that you implement as many safety mechanisms as you can around these opioid infusions. So the second recommendation is a recommendation which comes together for tertiary and community. And that is that we believe that institutions across the country should adopt standard methods for preparing and administering intermittent bolus opioid doses. When we did a survey across the country, we learned some very surprising things. One had to do with labeling, and one had to do with uh, preparing and administering intermittent doses. This is not the kind of work that you just leave up to an individual to decide on their own how they think they'll do things. The data that we have about the incidents that happen is too serious. It is very, very critical that we encourage clinicians to begin to adapt, uh, adopt standard practices for preparing and administering. And we will work towards supporting you in that. So we want admixing guidelines and calculation aids for nursing and pharmacy staff to be developed and handed out and uh, available at the point of care. I don't want you to think that we don't, aren't aware that many of you already have these in place. We know that uh, this is an area that's received a great deal of attention. But we will support those who haven't had the opportunity to work it through. And we will also take on some of the, the new issues that come up. Um, I know that one of them will have to do with automated dispensing cabinets and differentiating and segregating there. So this adopt standard method um, really has to do with calculation tools. There, the third recommendation for both tertiary and community has to do with prescribing. And you saw under the tactics slide that, of course, prescribing plays a very big role in safety and opioid usage. So we want to include the dosage by weight for all pediatric opioid orders for pediatric patients who weigh 40 kilograms or less. And that would be expressed as milligrams or micrograms per kilogram per dose, or milligrams or micrograms per kilogram per hour. 
Uh, I think that's very standard practice in tertiary centers, and I think that we will be able to provide some support to community hospitals who um, haven't made that complete transition to include dosage by weight for pediatric orders and pediatric patients. We will also provide um, examples of standard order sets, and we want the standard order sets always to reflect the adopted standard concentrations. Um, we probably will learn from you that some people have adopted standard concentrations that are different than this, and that's one of the things that we'll look forward to working through over the next several months. The next common recommendation for tertiary and community hospitals is about labeling. <laughs> and it's interesting, I went back to our community hospital survey a couple of days ago because this, this actual recommendation may be surprising to people. It says label every dose of oral or parenteral opioid. And at minimum, we want the drug name, the strength and concentration, wherever they may be made by practitioners and administered. And there'll be more guidelines around that. And the other interesting thing is that we're going to give you some examples of those labels and how they might be made available to clinicians that are preparing doses. Um, we wouldn't have made this recommendation had we not learned that there is a, a, a fair bit of practice out there where opioid drugs are traveling down hallways and unlabeled. And um, it doesn't it really, every sane person knows that you don't want a drug that's unlabeled in somebody's pocket. We all know why that happens, because you think you're going from point A to point B in a straight line without any interruptions. But the fact of the matter is that in hospitals in 2011, interruptions are more standard than not. And we, we strongly believe at CAFC and ICP Canada that this recommendation should be universally accepted, that we begin to go to standard labels, and that you never find any unlabeled doses of opioids running around Canadian institutions. Another, the fourth recommendation that applies to tertiary and community is that we want to develop and disseminate institution-wide dosing and monitoring guidelines for opioid use in pediatrics, including, including initial dose recommendations and maximum doses for opioid-naive patients. Those will be the kinds of guidelines to support care on the front lines. And we think that uh, if people don't have them, they will be uh, very, very welcome. We heard stories about nurses in community hospitals that were small, that usually had very well pediatric patients. And all of a sudden, they'd get a sick patient that came in that couldn't get to a tertiary hospital fast enough. And the nurses are really very nervous about it. They're doing their calculations over and over again on a napkin and getting five people to check it, because we really want to take care of these patients. And so it shouldn't be so difficult. It should be something where you just go and you walk through a dosing calculation there's an independent double check procedure that works for people, and we remove the fear from the front line. This is a recommendation for community hospitals only, because we know that most of the pediatric tertiary hospitals are just uh, pediatrics, although there's one or two in Canada that are combined. And we really believe that pediatric opioids should be segregated. We put that forward in um, 2002 in our adult opioid project, and we know that it's not uh, a slam dunk, super easy all the time, but we truly believe that there are mechanisms by which you can segregate, segregate pediatric opioids. And an area where this uh, isn't happening all the time is in the emergency department. And another recommendation that we've got that, com that applies to both tertiary and community hospitals is segregate, separate, and differentiate admixed opioid infusions from all other IV infusions. And we will provide a um, a variety of differentiation strategies on the CAN, and we will learn more about some of those strategies from you as we move forward, because this is a two-way thing. It's not just us telling you. We've learned a lot in our consultation with you to date, and we will learn more as we move this out, and we will uh, always be sharing. The uh, sixth recommendation for both tertiary and community is that we want all oral opioids stored in pre-filled oral syringes. We know that there are some bottles out there, and we want to get rid of them. So this will be a recommendation that uh, probably people will need to work through, and we'll give you all of the support that we can for going to pharmacy and therapeutics committee meetings and um, some guidelines on making them. But we would like to see patient-specific unit doses or standard doses appropriate to pediatric patients. We'd like to see limit 
to one concentration of morphine, and for sure oral syringes that can't be connected to any parenteral uh, systems in any way. And so once again, uh, we feel very strongly that this is something that which is doable. It's something that we can make it happen. It's just like uh, giving you dosing calculations. It's like labeling drugs as they go down the hallways. We should move to storing opioids, opioids in pre-filled oral syringes. We don't really have to have big bottles around. So what are our next steps? Well, on August the 9th, we're going to have a workshop um, in Toronto, and we're inviting as many people as we can possibly afford to invite, and we will talk about implementation strategies, the Knowledge Exchange Network demonstration, and we'll go through the tools and resources and dosing guidelines that are available on that. We'll have a forum for questions and sharing and ideas. We will then refine and update as we need to as, as comes out of that, and we'll talk about practical implementation. We will then plan a series of implementation webinars. Um, our, our plan, we were consultative all the way through this. We're very excited about launching, and we plan to be consultative now. And one of the things that we've found in medication system safety across the country is that there's many good ideas that are being implemented out there. Sometimes they need a little bit of tweaking, but when you bring those good ideas forward uh, to support people across the country, they're very welcome. So that idea of a little label, that, uh, if we tell you how it should be designed and how you can make it available to people, you could get hundreds of people uh, using that very, very quickly. So we will learn from you and also provide support to you in every way that we can, because both of our organizations are really hoping to make the system of opioid um, ordering and administration safer across the whole country. So this is toward a change in practice. It meets the ROP standards. We believe that we'll be ready to uh, work with Accreditation Canada to name some standard concentrations after we've learned more from you over the next few months. We want to make sure that we've got it right. We think we have. We've consulted very broadly, but we will learn a bit more in the next few months and ensure that uh, we take advantage of all that learning. And we're very, very excited about moving forward together and all of us in the best interest of our pediatric patients. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mark. That's absolutely fantastic. I look at it and I get really excited. Sorry if people can hear an overhead page on the CHEO end. Um, I wanted to highlight a couple of things because I think uh, that um, the entire presentation has got so much meat to it that it's really exciting. Uh, about um, the CAN, just to flag it for everybody, the Knowledge Exchange Network, if you are unfamiliar with it, I'd like to point you towards the um, CAPC Patient Safety uh, Collaborative website on the CAPC page. And also, if you have other further questions, you can certainly contact uh, Lisa at the CAPC office, and she'll uh, help direct you around, because it is a wealth of information that, um, with the ISMP information added, will just go up tenfold. Um, I think at this point, we'd like to just take a pause and uh, turn over to perhaps Lisa to help us manage any questions that there might be. So, um, Molly, your questions, if you have the ability to type them in on your computer, great. Um, Lisa, can I just ask for a little bit of direction on how we do deal with the technology end? Sure. Right now, I um, have a, a comment um, uh, from uh, Dr. Cronin. And uh, since I don't agree with recommendation number one for community hospitals, if they have a, a NICU, morphine alone won't be sufficient. And I may add that when I move to Kelowna, uh, I'll be looking after 30 weekers in a community hospital, and I will need access to fentanyl. Uh, uh, Gerarda, I was going to see if I can unmute you. I don't know if you have um, a microphone on your... Um... Well, Lisa, the... Um... The recommendation does say on the second slide that we would restrict access to the fentanyl injection for pediatric patients as needed. I didn't put the whole guideline there, but in fact we know that some community hospitals do have NICUs and do have very sick babies, and we're not saying that uh, this means they can't have the drugs they need in those cases. Uh, this recommendation was put forward by community hospitals that largely don't have NICUs, but when you do, you need to make sure that you restrict access and uh, provide safety mechanisms for the use of 
fentanyl and or hydromorphone. Okay, any other questions um, that you have heard out there, Lisa? Uh, no, nobody else has uh, written anything in yet. Um, Gerarda has commented back that uh, that's uh, an appropriate answer. That's a fine answer. <laughs> Gerarda, we'd be very pleased to have you share um, some of your ideas around this because the guidelines that we develop um, I think are going to be helpful to people and your, your experience and contributions to this are incredibly important. So we would love to have uh, a conversation with you about what you think those uh, safety mechanisms might be and where you need to use fentanyl and how we would describe it. And also, <coughs> it's, it's Elaine, I'd also like to add that uh, Dr. Gerardo Cronin, of course, has been a, a long-standing member of our of our opioid safety national advisory steering. So uh, we have had the the, uh, the 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 benefit, the extreme benefit of of Gerardo's guidance in in much of the development of the work that Mark has described on our behalf to you, and uh, and I'm I'm making an important assumption that uh, that's going to continue as we as we go forward, and uh, Gerardo will not only have years of experience that that she brings to this working within the Winnipeg. Uh, children's Hospital, but now we'll be moving to the Interior Health um, Authority in BC and running, um, you know, bringing that expertise from two large community hospitals in both Kamloops and uh, Kelowna, as well as as well as other areas within that region. So um, I think the the opportunity that we're describing will will continue. I hope so, and I'm quite envious, Gerarda. I think that that move sounds. Like a marvelous move. They're glad. They're lucky to have you. I also think that that would be a nice place to live. <laughs> so we'll talk. I just wanted to make one one comment, and I promise I won't hog the microphone. Um, I think that you know the the two presentations, and and Marg, I just want to thank you for representing um, really everybody on our patient safety collaborative that that's had an opportunity to provide invaluable input into the process for a couple of years now, um, as well as representing both ISMP and CAPSI's commitment to this work. I think the, the, the beauty of, of today's presentations, and, and if there's any feedback, uh, Greg, that you'd like to add as well, I see, first of all, one of our goals, one of our commitments, of course, is to align our recommendations with Accreditation Canada's work and recommendations and, and, and sort of vision for this going forward. And I see huge uh, synergy and, and, and common sense, quite frankly, between um, Greg's presentation and then what Mark has just shared with us as well. So that's validating and reassuring from my perspective, uh, but at the same time, I'm just wondering, Craig, if you wanted to add anything in terms of what what was presented today in connection with uh, with your uh, initial presentation. Well, I think you exactly hit the nail on the head that when we we find it's just it boils down to being fantastic for patients across the country. So, and and I mean. For ROP implementation, everything that Mark highlighted will be phenomenal for the pediatric health centers to meet the ROP. So I see it as being very complementary and should be perfect uh, to meet the needs of the ROP. Perfect. So thank uh, thanks to everyone on both teams for all the hard work on this one. And Greg, I think it's important to add if, if there's one or two people on the call who don't know this, way back in in 2006, Accreditation Canada and CAFSI um, developed a formal um, partnership, a memorandum of understanding to, to work in exactly this manner, ultimately to serve the population in the very best way we can, but also to work in alignment so we are creating that, that complementary synergy that really is going to bring us end results like the ones we're talking about today. Elaine, if there are no questions coming in right now, I just wanted to um, uh, reiterate that 
there's a, a lot of people on the line, and we would love to hear from you because we won't be able to reach everybody at the workshop in the summer. We will reach lots of people, but now that you're seeing these recommendations, um, any ideas that you have, any supporting documents that you have, um, concerns or comments would be very welcome. This is the summer of us uh, working together to launch this and meet your needs. And so um, I was thinking, for example, of tools. If people know of some tools that you've developed that you want shared that we haven't got, well, boy, we'd, we'd sure appreciate it because this is, as Elaine said, this has been a very consultative project and continues to be. Mark, there actually is a question, and I'll turn to, uh, to Lisa. So this comes from uh, Jennifer Turoad. It says, we occasionally use hydromorphone for our older peds population via PCA, ordered by our acute pain service. It is generally used when a patient has a known allergy to morphine and potentially could be used in patients with drug addiction. Do you have comments on this practice? I think that that's the kind of uh, guideline uh, activity that we'll be building into the Knowledge Exchange Network. So there will be specific groups of patients that need other drugs other than morphine. And so your institution should have discussed them, have policies and procedures. If you have pain committees, uh, that everybody is aware be manufactured and how you'll use them. And so if you have some guidelines for that, that's a perfect example that we'd like to see it. And then it could become a part of the Knowledge Exchange Network to help others. Is there anything you would add? No. Great. I have a couple of, I have a consultant in the room with me, and there's another couple on the phone that can add to any of these. Lisa, are there any more questions out there? Uh, not at the present time. Jennifer, I've unmuted you. I don't know if you are able to uh, make a comment or not. going to guess not. Perhaps she doesn't have a microphone on her, on her computer. On her computer. Um, if um, people have questions and they haven't, uh, they don't have a microphone on their computer um, and they haven't dialed in, um, you can dial in for subsequent uh, webinars. You can dial in on the telephone, use the access code and uh, dial in. Your, there will be a two-digit audio pin and that allows you to be able to uh, speak on the on the webinar. So uh, Jennifer commented that they do have some guidelines that they can share for this, so that's fabulous. Yes, I, I actually think that the tertiary hospitals, um, the tertiary hospitals by nature of the business are um, have a lot of these things in place and we're going to really try to take um, materials and guidelines and supporting documents that we can to hospitals that haven't had that much time and energy dedicated to pediatrics. And so Jennifer, thank you for that, if you share that document. And many of you that are on the line, uh, we learned from community hospitals. It was very, very surprising to us when we met and had common standard concentrations. And the community hospital said, no, no, we, we don't want all those drugs. But we do want you to help us when we need them. And uh, But we want to switch to morphine. And so. It is the community sector that I think has the potential to benefit the most. And if there's guidelines um, that you have that you've worked through and spent months on, we need them. Well, that's my opportunity to jump in because it <laughs> that is exactly what the CAFC Patient Safety Collaborative is all about, and we're all about sharing. I think uh, there's a couple of takeaways that we can take from today's um, presentation, and, and that is to, or presentations, is to share both of the presentations um, so that you have a, fr a ground, or I guess a framework or a springboard for why this is important in Greg's presentation, but then taking Mark's presentation out into your hospital so that they are aware that these guidelines are, are coming into play and that um, we you can start asking what sort of things do we have in place that we could actually share um, with ISMP. And I think that even if you are unable to attend the workshop as it gets planned from ISMP's end, um, I know that through the CAFC Patient Safety Collaborative, we will find ways to help people stay in the loop and stay connected with um, the great work that's been done to date so that they can um, receive the learnings of the masses and, and really 
um, move some of these important initiatives ahead. Um, I'm looking over my shoulder at my clock on my wall, and it is almost time to wrap up. Uh, so one more question to Lisa. Are there any more questions out there? No, uh, people are wondering how they can get involved uh, in the August 9th workshop. So there will be information going out um, to uh, some centers. It's uh, going to be a, a smaller uh, focus group, and we will be sending that information out uh, fairly soon, so within the next uh, probably 10 days. And uh, we'll keep everybody uh, uh, aware of what's going on as things uh, get moving. But if you if you don't end up hearing about um, the workshop, don't be dismayed because there will be ample opportunities, as I said, to um, keep this issue on our front burner and to make sure that you're in the loop. So uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact Lisa along the way. Yeah. Actually, I have one more question here. It says, do you have Great. a statement regarding codeine in the peds population? Oh, good question. <laughs> um, we had a statement, and we took it out. And uh, the reason that we took it out had to do with uh, we know that some tertiary centers are getting rid of codeine, and we spoke long and for a long time. We evaluated this uh, whether we would recommend to community hospitals across the country that they get rid of codeine. I'll tell you what the struggle is. The honest truth is that uh, there's a balance to be made between taking out codeine and then adding morphine as your discharge drug of choice. ISMP Canada gets lots of morphine errors reported. Uh, many of those errors are in the community. And so on balance, we weren't sure that we were ready to recommend that community hospitals get rid of codeine. Um, the, the potential for harm with uh, discharge prescriptions that people don't completely understand, um, it, 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 it's always a matter of balance. Uh, morphine can also be confused with hydromorphone. It's been mixed up with hydromorphone on many, many times. So the bottom line is that there isn't anything about this right now. But because CAFC represents the tertiary hospitals and many community hospitals, this is the beginning. And this is a, a work in progress. And as we move along in giving you more guidelines, we also will address current issues. And we know that that's a current issue. Excellent. Okay, well, I think given the time and on that note, I will take a moment to conclude and thank both Greg and Margaret for um, presenting at our CAFC Patient Safety Collaborative today. Lots of great information and takeaway that I hope you will um, uh, have the, take the weekend to mull and then as soon as it gets posted up on the Knowledge Exchange Network, certainly um, access it there. Thank you, thank you again to our speakers. And uh, just a final note, our next call for the collaborative is on Friday, June 24th, the same time, same place. And uh, Ian Shepard will be talking about the National Barcoding Project. So nice uh, segue from this presentation into next month's talk. Have a great weekend, everyone, and uh, we'll look forward to, to connecting with you next month.